look out to that. Okay, so I just, yes, I just started recording now, but uh, if you're watching the recording, you didn't miss very much. I just said that you can reach me by email or if the email doesn't work, you can try this and that these are the links to my office hours and that the, the yeah, so the course will be in person, but I will, uh, at least my plan is to also stream every lecture via Zoom and also to record every lecture and upload them to YouTube when I'm done. And uh, um, when they're up on YouTube, it sometimes takes a little while, it might even sometimes be the next day before they're up. But um, once they're up on YouTube, there also will be links to them in the, on the syllabus. Uh, um, um, but I'll also send you a link to the YouTube playlist that they'll all be on. Um, okay. Are there questions about any of the really basic, uh, oh, you like the Hello Kitty theme on my browser, thank you. It's called Hello Kitty in the air. See, she's flying in the air. Um, so, uh, uh, are there are there questions about any of that like basic stuff that I just went over? Um, okay, then there's here there's a short description of what the course will be like that will be about. I'll give a longer uh, version of that after I finish going through the syllabus. Um, course requirements. So there are two short essays. Um, these short essays are basically like responses to um, like uh, essay questions. Um, and uh, then there will be a final paper, which is a little bit more open ended. Four to six pages. And the papers are due by Canvas. They're due by 11.55 PM. Um, I only started saying that because people kept, I used to just say what day they were due, but people kept asking like exactly what time they were due. And I'm like, oh, 11.55. Actually, at first I said midnight, but it turned out whatever. That's kind of ambiguous, which day that belongs to. <laughs> So I said 11.55 p.m. The truth is I'm absolutely not sitting there with a stopwatch, like seeing exactly what minute your, your assignment comes in. Um, uh, but that's just, you know, so in other words, don't freak out like, oh, I'm five minutes late. I'm going to grade you down. I'm actually pretty relaxed about this. If you're worried, ask me for an extension. You can ask me for an extension before the paper is due. That's ideal. You can ask me for an extension after the paper is due. That's not as good, but um, but um, better than not handing it in. <laughs> so yeah, by all means, ask. Um, and. Um, and it also says here, attendance at lecture is strongly encouraged, but is not a course requirement. I certainly hope people will come to lecture either in person or virtually, especially because as of now, there's only 12 students in this course. So if people are not coming, I'm gonna be talking to myself <laughs> in an empty room, um, but I don't take attendance. So um, I never have, and I have no plan to. Um, <laughs> Uh, and um, anything else I should talk about here? Um, yeah, so these three books I've um, ordered, you know, via Baytree Bookstore. Um, if you want to get them somewhere else, they also have, I also have the ISBN here. Um, and uh, the other readings are already up on Canvas as PDFs. Um, also, these books are on reserve. Well, actually, 
these two are already on reserve at McHenry. This one, someone had uh, checked out by a ILL or something, so they have to get it back. But this one's for the end of the quarter anyway. Yes. Um, you have a question? Wait, I can't see who that is. Your name disappeared. Yeah. Um... So I was looking at PDFs for these books, and I know that the shelling, the system of transcendental, transcendental idealism um, is a translation. And I saw I could find a free version that was another translation. Is it important that it's the Virginia Peter Heath translation? Um, well, I didn't know there was another translation. It, I guess it's old. That's why it's free. Mm. Um, does it matter? Um, well, it's uh, probably different translations are really different. So it could be confusing. On the other hand, this translation is not especially great. <laughs> I'm going to, you know, I'm going to say before, uh, uh, at some point, I'm going to say some of the things that are bad about it. Um, but so, yeah, I mean, if it doesn't confuse you, go ahead and use a different translation. Okay, sounds good. Um, but you know, so if you want to, when you want to refer to quotes in your essays, you'll have to tell me what translation you're using so I can find them. Um, okay, that was a good question. Any other questions? Um, yeah, it says will be available online, but they actually are already available online. The assignments are also already available online. You can click here and see them. Um, right, so like there's, oh, well, it says <laughs> parts five and six coming soon. Um, uh, they may or not may not be coming soon. I wrote coming soon last time I taught the course. <laughs> I never filled them in, but anyway, as of now, there's three choices, and there may be more. Um, okay, let's see. Back in there. Um, okay, and. So the other thing I need to call attention to right away, I know I mentioned this in email, is that next Tuesday is a Jewish holiday and I won't be able to lecture on that day. So there will be no class on that day. Um, so our next meeting will be hopefully in person on the 30th. And then the following week, there's gonna be a makeup class on Monday, which will be only via Zoom. And then after that, everything I hope will be normal. <laughs> Assuming there's no more health emergencies, natural disasters, et cetera. Um, okay. Um, yeah, and links to the to the YouTube videos will pop up here on the syllabus. I'll put them here. Um, when they, a link to them when they go up. Okay. Um, okay, and uh, I have just uh, one other thing before I start talking about the content of the course is something I always try to explain about my teaching style, which is that, you know, um, like, in some type of courses, the readings and the lectures are kind of parallel, you know, like maybe in math courses or something, like you could either listen to the lecture or you could do the reading. Um, in some kind of courses, the reading like supplements the lecture, like it's, you know, other stuff that didn't get to in the lecture. But in a course like this, the lecture is about the reading. I'm talking about the reading. So, um, Hold on a second. Go around the side if you want to back, if you want to talk to her. I'm teaching right now. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, 
what was I saying? Right. So, um, so, you know, like I can't really substitute for shelling or whoever, uh, probably even less for the other people we're going to read later. Like I can't summarize what Nietzsche says in Thus Spike Zarathustra, so you don't have to read it. <laughs> um, I just, I mean, I just can't. So, um, so uh, like, I'll try my best to make my lectures intelligible if you haven't done the reading, but I'm pretty much, you know, talking about the reading. I'm not assuming that you understood it. I'm not necessarily assuming that I understood it, <laughs> but I am understanding that you read it, read it, and now you're like trying to, you need help understanding what it was about or something like that. I'm, I can't really summarize it and replace it. Um, okay. Um, so now a little bit more about the content of the course. So first of all, this is this is the second time I've taught this course. The first time was two years ago. It's still a little bit of an experiment for me. Um, I the I had never taught most of this material uh, before the first time I gave this course two years ago. Some of it I hadn't even read until I started preparing. Uh, you know, the summer before I taught that course. Um, so now it's the second time around, but it's still. Uh, you know, stuff that I'm trying to figure out myself. Um, and it's also really different from material I'm more used to lecturing on, especially the later thinkers on this syllabus. Um, you'll see that they don't have a lot of arguments. Um, they don't have much in the way of technical terminology. They do use words in special and unusual ways that you have to pay attention to, but it's not really like with Kant or Locke or Leibniz or, you know, Aristotle, or it's not like they're technical terms that you have to figure out, you know, exactly how they're using them in their system. Um, it's the type of philosophical writing where questions tend to arise. Is this philosophy at all, or is it, you know, literature? Let me actually stop sharing this syllabus now. In a second, I'm going to start sharing the whiteboard, but I guess I don't need it yet. So, um, right. So it's the type of philosophical writing where um, some question will arise, is this really literature? And actually almost all these um, writers either wrote poetry themselves, or at least in Schelling's case, were closely associated with people who wrote poetry. Um, um, and they sometimes include poems in their philosophical works. And um, all of these issues are actually characteristic of 19th century philosophy. So, um, so you know, uh, getting towards part of the reason why I chose these particular authors. Um, this is something that, um, although it's not characteristic of every important 19th century philosopher, um, for example, Hegel doesn't sound like literature. He doesn't sound like any kind of normal language either, but he certainly doesn't sound like poetry. Um, and he's full of technical terminology and arguments. Uh, Schopenhauer, Marx, right? There's a lot of important 19th century philosophers this is not true of. But there's a lot of important 19th century philosophers it is true of, and that's much less the case before or after the 19th century. And it's not just a matter of fashion either. We'll see that there are, see more or less clearly that there's some kind of philosophical motives behind it something about what they think the function of poetry is and how it's related to the function of philosophy makes them go in this direction of sounding more like poetry or actually writing poetry. Um, okay, so that's kind of a, Schelling is the least like that of the people we're gonna read. And also at least, 
in some sense, the most difficult to the people we're going to read because it is full of arguments, but they're really difficult arguments. <laughs> and it is full of uh, technical terminology, but it's weird technical terminology. He assumes that you not only are familiar with Kant, but are familiar with the way he and Fichte interpret Kant, which is unusual. <laughs> so um, um, in that sense, the shelling reading will be the most difficult and the longest. Um, uh, the later people are more pleasant to read, I guess I would say, but um, uh, they also, as we go along, become more opaque in the sense that um, you can't, there isn't a structure that tells you that there's a thesis that we're headed towards and that there's objections and so on and so forth. There's, um, well, it's hard to describe, but if you haven't read Emerson or Fuller or Nietzsche before, um, or even Coleridge to some extent, uh, you'll just have to see what it's like. Um, okay, so that's some kind of foretaste of what these authors will be like. And now I wanna say a little bit more about why I chose these authors in particular. So, because the 19th century obviously was 100 years long, <laughs> um, it was 100 years long everywhere, so a lot of different things happened. Um, and so obviously this course couldn't possibly be kind of a summary of everything that happened, even in, say, Western philosophy in the 19th century. Um, but there was one big event at the end of the 18th century, which overshadows almost everything that happens in the 19th century. And the big event was Kant, right? So now maybe I should start sharing a whiteboard. So that will work. Advanced. Want to go from other camera. And it's black. Or it's, it's only one thing I can try, which is That camera, no, not that camera, the real camera. All right, you know what? I'm just gonna have to do it without a whiteboard. Um, uh, It's not that bad, really. It's just usually, I, I mean, it helps me think even to just write a few things down as I'm talking. Oh, great. <laughs> All right. Um, so, right. So the big event at the end of the 18th century was Kant. Um, right, he actually died very early in the 19th century, but his important stuff was towards the end of the 18th century. Um, and uh, the, initial impact of Kant, Immanuel, I guess, I'm assuming you've heard of Immanuel Kant before. <laughs> I hope that's true. <laughs> um, but um, um, he was a German philosopher. His most famous work was the Critique of Pure Reason, which is the way right, we have philosophy 106 is all about that one book. Um, so, uh, Philosophy 107, 19th century philosophy is what happened after Kant wrote that book, essentially. Um, now, I mean, the initial impact of that, of course, was in Germany, um, but pretty soon, and we'll be looking at some of the, or I guess like one main channel of transmission, pretty soon it started to spread to England, Scotland, France, and, um, for the first time significantly America, 
right? It was in the 19th century that, uh, that it, you know, important philosophy started to be written in America. Um, and other places, Denmark, whatever. But um, so, um, so the thread, the particular thread of that that we're gonna be following is that, first of all, in Germany, there were these people called the post-Kantian idealists. And the big three, for some reason, there's always a big three. The big three post-Kantian idealists are Fichte, See, it would be nice if I could write this on the board. I don't know what to do though. I already tried unplugging the camera and plugging it back in. <laughs> That's uh, the only way of fixing computers. So that didn't work, it won't work. Um, you know what? I can write their names in the chat at least, just so you'll know how to spell them. Fishta. Schelling and Hegel. It's really pronounced Fichte. <laughs> I can't do that sound very well. Um, right? They're called the post Kantian idealists. Um, there were other people in Germany who were post Kantian and who were idealists, but are not part of the post Kantian idealists. And the main one was Schopenhauer. Um, So, right, Schopenhauer basically thought that those other three people, Fichte, Schelling, and Hegel, were a load of nonsense. And he says that pretty explicitly. Um, uh, but um, so, I mean, that's a different direction you could follow things. That would also lead through Nietzsche, by the way, but it would be a different way of getting from Kant to Nietzsche. Um, so, um, so anyway, of those three post-Kantian idealists, um, the most important one probably was Hegel. So, um, you know, uh, I think actually the course description, the description in the catalog says that this course will be about Schopenhauer and Hegel and Nietzsche. Um, and, you know, I thought about doing it that way when I first proposed that I should teach it. It had not been taught by anyone for a long time. Um, but I decided um, that wasn't the best way to go for reasons I'll, I'll try to explain. But anyway, Hegel was probably most of the important, both in the sense that, um, like, I actually think of him as the best philosopher out of the three. And I sometimes teach a course on Hegel's logic, uh, a 190 or a grad seminar on Hegel's logic. Um, um, but also in the sense that he was most influential in the long run, probably. It's hard to know how to measure that. But for example, Kierkegaard and Marx are mostly responding to, to Hegel, not so much to Fichte and Schelling. Um, however, Fichte and Schelling were, especially Schelling, were the first to reach a large English-speaking audience. Um, later on, there were Hegelian movements, both in Britain, so the so-called so British neo-Hegelians, and in America, believe it or not, there was this school called the St. Louis Hegelians. <laughs> which played an important uh, uh, role in the history of American philosophy, but which no one reads that stuff now. Um, even I haven't read it yet, but I hope to. <laughs> um, but, uh, but before that, um, Schelling was um, brought into English speaking philosophy, first of all, by Coleridge. So Coleridge, uh, you may have heard of as a poet, and he was a poet, uh, important romantic poet, um, but he actually thought of himself more as a philosopher than as a poet. And he actually wrote more philosophy than he wrote poetry. Um, and, uh, his philosophy, as he grew older, he became more uh, conservative. 
both politically conservative and somehow that was tied up with his philosophical ideas as well. So um, like in his youth, he was a fan of the French Revolution and stuff like that. But by the time the Coleridge that we're seeing is um, uh, Tory, right? Like in favor of um, royal and aristocratic power in the English constitution. Um, and, um, and also, uh, uh, um, like high church Anglican, basically in favor of the traditional Episcopal version of Anglicanism. Um, and uh, he uh, wants to defend those views philosophically. And therefore, um, one of the things that he's looking for in Schelling is an antidote to Locke and Locke's Whiggish um, liberal empiricist philosophy. So, I mean, it wasn't only that. We'll see that Schelling is already very interested in the connection between philosophy and poetry, which obviously a romantic poet like Coleridge would be interested in whatever the politics of it, um, but it's those things somehow mixed together. Um, and, you know, I guess um, one reason this works is because although Kant, so like Kant saw his big achievement as he was the one who divided the history of philosophy before him into 100 C and 100 B, right? Into like empiricism and rationalism. And he saw his achievement as mediating between those two and like also correcting their common defects, right? By putting together the two sources of all human knowledge, experience and reason. Um, but the post-Kantian idealists went more in the rationalist direction. They were not that interested in the British empiricists. And Schelling in particular is very close to Leibniz. Now, I don't know, see, if we were in person now, I would ask everyone to raise their hands. How many people took 100, has taken 100B? I know you don't have to have taken that. And I also haven't taught 100B for years, um, but um, anyway, if you have taken 100B, then some connections between Schelling and Descartes, and especially Schelling and Leibniz, which Schelling makes himself explicitly sometimes, but other times he just alludes to them, might be helpful in understanding him. I'm going to say something along those lines towards the end of the class today. Um, if you haven't taken 100B, well, um, you know, in the history of philosophy, you kind of have to start from one end or the other. <laughs> like, if you've never, like I read Kant before I read Leibniz and uh, that was what clued me in that there must be something important in Leibniz. <laughs> right? uh, this was a long time ago when I was a uh, grad student in astrophysics. <laughs> before I switched to philosophy, I was sitting in my room in the grad dorms at Princeton trying to read the critique of pure reason by myself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, ridiculous. But anyway, right. So the point is, uh, if you haven't read Leibniz, it still could be helpful. I'm still going to mention these connections because my, maybe you will read Leibniz later. Or even if you're never going to read philosophy again and you're going to go to law school, I'm still, I think, like what I'm most trying to teach is something about how to read difficult texts like this which I hope is useful um, for a lot of reasons. Um, I mean, not just like professionally useful, but like, for example, the American Constitution is a difficult text that's hard to read. <laughs> and a lot of people don't know how to think about that, maybe. Or, I mean, a lot don't. Maybe I know more, I'm not sure. Anyway, so getting back from that, <laughs> Um, so, I, right, there are these connections between rationalism and the post-Kantian idealists, and I think that was part of what 
Coleridge saw in them, again, an antidote to Locke. And the transcendentalists in America, um, so the transcendentalists that you most often hear of are Emerson and Thoreau. We're also gonna be reading another important transcendentalist who's less well-known, like many important uh, women philosophers were less, less, less well-known, uh, Margaret Fuller. Um, they, all three of them were part of what's called uh, the Boston Transcendentalists. Right? The school as a whole is usually known as New England Transcendentalism. There was also a Vermont branch, which um, is again, not as well known as the Boston branch. Um, so those people also all were looking for an antidote to Locke, right? Kind of like before they came on the scene, the people who were, there wasn't, like I said, that much original philosophy being written in America, but such as it, you know, philosophy was being taught in America. Um, and it was kind of, uh, under the sway of the British empiricist school. So these people kind of rebelled against that and they did it partly by looking to Coleridge. Um, so uh, Coleridge's Aids to Reflection, which we're gonna be, that's the main text we're gonna be reading part of, um, was published in Vermont um, in the 1820s, I guess um uh by uh what's his first name frederick maybe marsh the founder of the university of vermont <laughs> and a big fan of coleridge and it became very influential in all these circles so and they but they also were interested in shelling most of them didn't know german um some of them did but uh uh, eventually Schelling was translated, but that took a while. Like I said, I actually didn't know that any translation, I guess I knew there were older translations, but they were not in print. So why should that stop me from using them? I don't know. Anyway, um, but a lot of the influence of Schelling was secondhand via Coleridge or via those few people they knew who could read it in German. Um, And the term transcendentalism was actually introduced into English by Thomas Brown. Thomas Brown was a 19th century um, English, well, Scottish empiricist. It's actually important in this period not to confuse England and Scotland because they didn't confuse each other. <laughs> uh, so uh, a 19th century Scottish empiricist, a member of the common sense school, and he wrote a review of Kant's philosophy, which he hadn't read in the original because he didn't know German, but he read a summary of it in French and he wrote a review of it. And in that review, he introduced this word transcendentalism into English. And that became the word that the people in New England used to describe their school. That's what the history of philosophy is like. Okay, so, um, um, so yeah, so this is a kind of explicitly like anti-Brown version of German idealism, anti-Thomas Brown. Like you're, you're saying how transcendentalism is this bad thing. Guess what? We're transcendentalists. <laughs> That's what was going on. And then Nietzsche at the end of the 19th century, Nietzsche actually died in 1900. He wasn't really active for a few decades before that. That was, you know, he had his breakdown and whatever. But, uh, but in a sense, he like, uh, um, this uh, Schelling's system of transcendental philosophy was published in 1800 and Nietzsche died in 1900. So I could say this course actually exactly <laughs> fills up the 19th century. Nietzsche was, started off basically as a follower of Schopenhauer. Now, I mean, this, you know, I can't get into what were the issues between Hegel and Schopenhauer and stuff like that in this course, but he started off as a follower of Schopenhauer. He did not have that much interest in Hegel or Schelling, but eventually he became very disenchanted with Schopenhauer. And meanwhile, 
um, he read in translation and was extremely impressed by the works of Ralph Waldo Emerson. And we'll see him actually mentioning Emerson. Um, Emerson is one of the very few philosophers that Nietzsche has something good to say about. <laughs> um, so, um, so although he wasn't interested in Schelling or Coleridge uh, at all, as far as I know, um, um, by, and I, he didn't know anything about Fuller. Again, you know, so this is one of the problems with incorporating women philosophers into courses like this. They're part of the history of philosophy, but they were neglected, right? So I'd really love to know how, what, how Nietzsche would respond to some of the things that Fuller said. It could be very illuminating, but he didn't read it. So, uh, but he did read Emerson um, and Nietzsche's impact was huge. Um, probably more than any other 19th century philosopher, not excluding Hegel or John Stuart Mill or Frege. Um, Nietzsche was like, if Kant was the big event right before the 19th century, Nietzsche was the big event at the end of the 19th century. I guess you could say that Marx was more influential if you count like boots on the ground, <laughs> literally speaking. But uh, Nietzsche was more influential on in the history of philosophy, I believe. Um, so, um, so in the end, I chose this particular thread for several reasons. First of all, it's continuous, right? Like if we read Schopenhauer, Hegel, and Nietzsche, it would be like Schopenhauer and Hegel have nothing to say to each other, and Nietzsche is not interested in Hegel. And um, pretty soon he starts saying Schopenhauer is an idiot too. <laughs> and that would be the course, you know. So they're really kind of like talking past each other. Whereas this actually is a thread where you can see how Kant's ideas trace through the 19th century to the end, to something that had a huge influence. And I guess I'll say it had a huge influence on Heidegger, on subsequent philosophy in France, but also the logical positivists were interested in Nietzsche. Um, they didn't say much about him later on, but early on they did. So I don't know if you know about the split between um, Anglophone and um, continental philosophy in the 20th century, but those are basically two branches of it. They both started in Germany and they were both interested in Nietzsche. So that was one thing, but also, you know, it allows me to, to go through and show what was happening in America in this period, which should be interesting to us, especially because Emerson and Nietzsche are, I mean, sorry, Emerson and Fuller, they're not just American philosophers in the sense that there are now are like obviously thousands and thousands of American philosophers, meaning people who write philosophy in America. They're philosophers of America, right? They're trying to understand what America means. Um, um, what it should mean, what it could mean, given how, um, on the one hand, it seems to be founded on an ideal. It seems to be a philosophical nation in some sense. But on the other hand, something seems to be really wrong with that ideal, um, right? The things we're gonna be reading were written before the Civil War. So slavery is still in full blast. <laughs> um, uh, neither Emerson nor Fuller are in favor of slavery. I hope like needless to say. Um, oh, someone asked in the, what was 1800? So Schelling's system of transcendental philosophy, which is the first thing we're reading was 1800. Yeah. Um, so for all those reasons, I thought this was the best of like many possible ways to go through the, eight, the 19th century. Um, that's the end of my general introduction. I'm gonna start talking about the, the first, about Schelling, well, no, more about preparation for the first reading, really. I'll, I'll talk more about 
what little I have to say about Schelling as a person, I'll say at the beginning next time. It's really very little actually. But, for, but first, are there more questions about all that stuff I was just putting out? It might have been clearer if I could have drawn a like timeline on the blackboard, whiteboard or something, but it didn't work. Okay, no questions. Okay, so I'll just say, like I said, the first reading, I think, I mean, you'll find that it's probably a little bit too long, although actually in this case, you have a whole week to do it. But remember that there's gonna be three lectures the following week. So you should probably uh, try to get ahead. I know I'm gonna try to get ahead as best I can. Um, so, uh, but anyway, you'll you'll find that it's probably a little bit too long and it's it's hard. Um, um, but I'm gonna say things, I mean, so obviously I'm gonna try to explain next time more what happened, but I'm gonna try to say some things now that might help prepare for it. So first of all, I think maybe this might actually be the most important thing. There's three main parts to the first reading. There's the foreword and the introduction, and then there's part one of the system. So the foreword, um, so the way that Schelling has split the labor between the foreword and the introduction is that the foreword basically talks about the relationship between this whole book and other parts of philosophy, according to Schelling. So this book is about what Schelling calls transcendental idealism. That's Kant's terminology, but Schelling has his own use for it or his own interpretation of Kant's use of it. Um, so this book is about transcendental idealism. That's why it's called System of Transcendental Idealism. The other main part of philosophy, according to Schelling, is philosophy of nature. So the foreword is about the relationship between transcendental idealism and philosophy of nature. And then the introduction is basically an overview of what's gonna happen in this book that is in the system of transcendental idealism. That's the way that those two are divided from each other. So um, um, what that means basically is when you're reading those two parts, you shouldn't be surprised that they're kind of like, um, gesturing towards things that Schelling is going to do in another book, in the case of the foreword, or like later on in this book, in the case of the introduction. You shouldn't expect everything to be, you know, like clear. He's just looking ahead to prepare you for what the parts are gonna be. Whereas part one, which is about the first principle of all knowledge is where he starts getting down into detail and actually making an argument that's supposed to, you know, be complete, I guess. Um, and, you know, so for that reason, next time in my lecture, I'm mostly gonna focus on part one and you should probably mostly focus, focus on part one um, in your reading. What, uh, the only thing I'll say now about the overall framework is that the overall framework that this, that, that, um, Schelling is working on it has to do with the possibility of human freedom. This is a huge issue in Kant. It's sort of the central issue in Kant. Um, and it's really the central issue in Kant's immediate predecessors, Hume and Leibniz, um, about the relationship between causation in the natural world and um, um, free human action. How can those be consistent with each other? Um, and uh, the way Kant understood that is that it's an issue about the relationship between theoretical philosophy and practical philosophy. So you'll see a lot in that forward and introduction about theoretical and practical philosophy. Theoretical philosophy just means 
philosophy that asks the question, what is what are things like? What is true? What is the world like? What is nature like? What should I believe about it? What can I know about it? That's theoretical philosophy. Practical philosophy is philosophy that asks the question, what should I do? So practical philosophy is basically ethics. This terminology goes back to Aristotle. If people have had courses, oh, I see, actually, I just realized the person asked not what is 1800, what is 100B? 100B is the rationalists course at UCSC. 100C is empiricists. Uh, that's a long delayed explanation of that. Um, I guess I thought, well, if you're not philosophy majors, you might not know that. If you're philosophy majors, you should know that because you have to take some of those 100 series courses to graduate. So you should look into it. Um, but uh, sorry, what was I saying? Um, right, so that terminology, I, I usually end up introducing that in every course. If you had a course with me before, um, you've heard this before. I won't say too much about it now, but, um, but you know, that question about the relationship between natural causality or natural necessity or just necessity period, fate, as Emerson and Nietzsche call it, the relationship between that and freedom or human power um, is, you know, is going to keep coming up throughout the course. And that's the big question that's in the background of what Schelling is doing. But in part one, he gets into that issue. And this is basically was Kant's strategy too. The first book he wrote, well, not the first book he wrote, but the first book he wrote in his critical period, The Critique of Pure Reason was about theoretical philosophy. And it was about epistemology basically, about the possibility of knowledge. So that's also Schelling's strategy following Kant to get to this big question about the possibility of freedom, right? And the possibility of freedom is a central issue for practical philosophy because practical philosophy, again, is about what you should do. And a command, what you should do, seems to presuppose that you can do it, that you're free to do it. But how is that consistent with natural necessity? So, um, um, so, but again, the way into that question is going to be by way of what looks at first like much narrower and more technical questions about the nature of knowledge. Um, I really would like the whiteboard. I'm going to just try one more time to make sure. It's better. That never happens. I mean, I could switch cameras to the whiteboard and you wouldn't see me, or you would see my back writing on the whiteboard. Maybe I should do that. Let's see. Well, actually, I don't know if that will work either. Maybe I have to reset the USB ports. All right, I'm not going to go into that now. I'll just do it with no whiteboard. Okay, so um, okay, so what is the technical question about knowledge? So at least one way to understand this is to start with a basic issue for the rationalists. So the, rash, the continental rationalists, and again, there's a big three. The big three is Descartes, Spinoza, and Leibniz. Um, those are the people I usually teach when I do teach 100B. Maybe if I did it again now, I would try to diversify the syllabus, but then again, maybe not. It's, there's little enough room 
as there is. But anyway, be that as it may. So um, there, um, that was one school of philosophy in the 17th and early 18th century. And on the other side are the people we call the British empiricists. And they're the people we teach in 100C. And they are the big three as Locke, Barclay, and Hume. So those people were split what the difference between rationalism and empiricism means. They were split over the question of um, what is the source of all human knowledge? What is it all based on? What is it justified by? Or how is it derived? Something like that. And the empiricist side says basically sensation, experience. Those aren't exactly the same thing, but you could say either one. And the rationalist side says reason. So actually before the modern period, when, these pe when this split occurred, like Aristotelians always said, you need both. Human knowledge needs both sense and reason. But these people split and one side, one took the only sense and the other took only reason. Um, and Kant coming along after this said, well, this isn't working, partly because they ended up with very, very strange conclusions on both sides. Like the world doesn't exist basically type conclusions. So um, Kant says, this is not working. Some kind of mistake has been made here. In a way it's the same mistake on both sides, right? Like they both didn't understand how these two sources of knowledge have to work together. We need both sense and reason. Um, but like I said, Schelling um, and the other post-Kantian German idealists go back more towards the rationalist side. And for the rationalist side, um, well, first of all, I mean, I think for us, that tends to be the harder one to understand. Like, how could someone think that everything we learn about the world, we learn not from experience, right? Not from sensing the world, but from reasoning. So the basic strategy is something like this. I try to get clear on what I'm thinking about when I think about, for example, myself or a body, like Descartes' example in the meditations is a lump of wax. I think I'm seeing this lump of wax. What do I think I'm seeing? What am I thinking about when I think about the lump, lump of wax? And that must tell you what the thing is because you can't kind of accidentally be thinking about the wrong thing. <laughs> that's, uh, that's the best way I can put this strategy, right? Like whatever um, my thought hits, if anything, that's gonna be part of the problem. But if anything, it's gonna be exactly what I was thinking about and not something else. So if I can figure out what I'm thinking, I can figure out what the thing is that I'm thinking about. It has to match it exactly. So for example, Descartes uses this strategy in the meditations ultimately to prove that he is not the same as any body. In particular, not the same as what he's always called my body because um, it's been established at the beginning of the meditations that he can doubt that any body exists and yet be sure that he exists, right? Like at the very beginning of the meditations, the, you know, Descartes or his character, the meditator succeeds in doubting that any body exists. And then they're like, well, um, doesn't that mean that I don't know that anything exists, but at the beginning of the second minute or towards the beginning of the second meditation, they realize, oh no, I can't doubt that I exist. They, so they still haven't proved that any body exists, but they know, the meditator knows that 
I myself exist. So that shows that what I'm thinking about when I think about myself is not the same thing I'm thinking about when I think about a body. If it were, I wouldn't be able to doubt that one exists while being certain that the other exists. They're two different thoughts and therefore they're two different things. That's the rationalist strategy. So the result of this process of basically what it amounts to is like clarifying what I'm thinking when I, when I think something by taking it apart into its pieces, seeing what it actually contains, or in other words, analyzing it, right? Analysis means, um, analuen in Greek means like to like resolve something into its parts to like, luen means like to untie or release or and analuen means like, that, yeah, split up kind of, right? So analysis is taking apart my concepts to see what they contain and thereby trying to learn something. And what I learn is what Kant therefore calls an analytic judgment. And I, I'm introducing this terminology because you're gonna see Schelling talking about analytic versus synthetic judgments, right? So an analytic judgment is like is a proposition that expresses something that I can learn is true by taking apart my concepts into their pieces. And its basic principle is the principle of identity, which is, like just maybe a fancier way of what I was trying to say before when I said, what I'm thinking about is exactly what I think when I'm thinking about and not something else. And Schelling writes that principle as A equals A, right? So you'll see him talking at length about the principle A equals A. The principle A equals A, um, as he says explicitly at one point, this is on page 22, this proposition is evident and certain. And then skipping a little bit after that, which I'll come back to, for it says no more than this, in thinking A, I think nothing else but A. Right, so all the analytic judgments. So like, what's an example of an analytic judgment? According to Kant, an example would be all bodies are extended, right? Meaning all bodies take up space. So Kant claims in agreement with Descartes that when I think of a body, what I'm thinking of is something extended. So um, the proposition all bodies are extended relies on the fact that extended was already contained in my concept body. And I've just taken it apart into its pieces and shown or clarified for myself that extension was in it already. That's an analytic judgment. And again, it works on the principle of identity. Of course, when I say all bodies are extended, that doesn't have the form A equals A, but it's true because extended was part of the subject concept body. And so it rests on the fact that extended is extended, right? An extended thing is an extended thing. That's the A equals A. Okay, but empiricists are gonna say about this, Locke calls these type of judgments um, trivial propositions. <laughs> Right? Empiricists will say, and Kant will agree, I can never really extend my knowledge by that process. Only I can only clarify what I'm thinking, but I can't learn anything. Um, and um, um, one way of seeing that, or one way of expressing that is to say this process, not only, as I already pointed out, doesn't show that I'm thinking of something that actually exists. So that's actually important in the meditations, right? At the point in the second meditation where the meditator realizes what a body is, the meditator still can't prove that there are any bodies. And the proof that there are bodies 
comes in a weird way via a proof of the existence of God in the third meditation. Now, I mean, if this were a course about Descartes or about uh, some later philosophers like Levinas who are influenced by Descartes, I might go into detail trying to explain why that weird way actually is really interesting and important. But a lot of people after Descartes have just been like, oh yeah, you mean uh, then like a miracle occurs and you know bodies exist, <laughs> right? Like what kind of proof is that, right? So, but in any case, like just by knowing that a body is a body or an extended thing is an extended thing, I, don't, I can't say whether there are any, but it's not, it's worse than that. Both the empiricists and Kant will say, and Schelling repeats this, just by knowing that, I don't even know whether a body is possible. Why well, don't I know whether a body is possible? Well, you know, like, yeah, I found that I have a concept that contains these two parts. What are the two parts, or at least two parts? So in the case of body, the two parts are substance and extended, I guess. A body is an extended substance. You know, so I, I realized that I put these two things together, but um, I didn't have any reason for putting those two things together. What kind of reason could I have had? Well, the law of identity definitely won't get me there. To be a substance, whatever it means exactly, is definitely not supposed to be the same as being extended. But the whole point of the meditations is that I myself am a substance that's not extended, that's not a body. So, um, you know, uh, so I can't tell by the principle of identity that those two things should go together or can go together or allowed to go together. As far as I know, I just arbitrarily put them together into a concept and started thinking. But to know that something is possible, let alone actual, I need some kind of constraint that tells me what things I'm allowed to put together into a concept and what things I'm not. And Leibniz himself gives an example of this, right, which actually is a little weird example, but the example of the greatest the greatest speed. So actually now we think there is a, a greatest speed, at least the greatest speed that something can go, right? The speed of light. But, uh, but you know, Leibniz with good reason thought that was absurd. So, um, so he's saying, yeah, I can define, you know, my concept to mean the greatest speed. And then I can analyze it and I can learn things about it. The greatest speed is a speed. The greatest speed is greater than other speeds, right? Like all those things are quote unquote certain because of the principle of identity. But the truth is you can't put together in one concept greatest and speed. Every speed has some other speed that's higher right? There is no highest velocity. And, you know, if you don't like that, say like highest natural number, right? We still don't think there's a highest natural number, but you can very well define the concept highest natural number. And you can think all kinds of things about it that would be true by the principle of identity, but you're not only not thinking about something actual, you're not thinking about something possible. So Schelling says this, um, and now I'll read the full quote on page 22. The proposition that is A equals A is evident and certain, quite regardless of whether A is something really existing or merely imagined or even impossible. For it says no more than this, in thinking A, I think nothing else but A. So according to Kant, and Schelling agrees with this, in order to get knowledge, you need something that goes beyond the principle of identity that tells you not like, that is judgments that aren't formed by taking something apart, but by putting things together in the right way to get something at least possible and hopefully even actual. And the result is what Kant calls a synthetic judgment. 
right? Because um, um, like uh, suntithenai in Greek means putting together. Soon means together. Right. So, um, well, actually, it means it means with or together or whatever. Here it means together. So, um, so actual knowledge is contained in a synthetic judgment that puts two things together that are not identical. And this is what Schelling will write as A equals B. And at least to begin with, if you think, wait, well, you know, A and B are different, how can A equal B? You can think of it as meaning this, the thing that is A is the same thing as the thing that is B. That's what a synthetic judgment, that's how a synthetic judgment works. So an example of a synthetic judgment, according to Kant, is all bodies are heavy. That is the law of universal gravitation, right? So um, Kant says, so, so the rationalists thought Newtonian gravitation was absurd because this tendency to move towards another body is not part of my concept of body. My concept of body is an extended substance. It doesn't contain this mysterious tendency to move towards other bodies. So Kant says, true, the concept doesn't contain it, but we can learn that the thing that the concept refers to contains it, right? So it turns out that the thing I'm thinking is not just what I'm thinking and nothing else. The thing I'm thinking is itself and sometimes other things. And I need to make synthetic judgments in order to learn what other things, what other things it possibly is in, in addition to what's contained in my concept. So again, like I have my concept of a body as an extended thing, and then I do something to learn that um, those things that I'm thinking of through that concept also can be thought of through a completely different concept, heavy. So, um, Now, what's the order? I... Well, let me say this, right. So how could you get from this to not only knowing that, that it's possible, but to knowing that it's actual? So I haven't said anything about where these rules come from yet, about what things you can put together. Um, but um, the way Schelling understands it, this is already something that's going beyond Kant. I don't think Kant agrees with this, although Schelling may think that Kant agrees with it. <laughs> Again, the history of, of philosophy is a complicated thing. So, um, so the way Schelling thinks about it is this, as soon as there's some constraint on what I'm allowed to think for certain purposes or whatever, that constraint is what it means that my thought has an external object, right? My thought is trying to match up with, to harmonize with, to agree with some rule that is not my own rule. At least, um, it doesn't appear on the surface to be my own rule. Um, it appears to me as an alien rule that I have to reconcile my thought to. And Schelling says, that's what it means that, that my thought is not just contained in itself and not just a game of analyzing my own concepts, but is actually about something else. Is there a question about that? 
because this is actually a pretty important thing that Schelling, move that Schelling is making. That's kind of a buzzword. I'm not sure what a better way to say that would be. But that's what people say now, an important move that Schelling is making, <laughs> right? Um, uh, that actually like running up against a constraint of what I'm allowed to think, which is the whole nature of synthetic propositions. Synthetic truths have the, have the form that these two things can go together, not any other two things. So Schelling is saying that that itself is the confrontation with something outside my thought. So this is how he says these, I'm gonna read uh, two passages on, from page 23. I guess, I think one is right after the other actually, but I, didn't, I don't have my book down here. Um, so, uh, First, he says, in a synthetic proposition, he says, quote, the object is not merely determined by the thought of it. Right, so that's just saying it's not like an analytic judgment. In the analytic judgment, the whole point is the object is only picked out by my concept of it, so it has to contain exactly what's in my concept and nothing, nothing else. In a synthetic proposition, the object is not merely determined by the thought of it. It is regarded as real, since anything is real that cannot be brought about merely by thought. And therefore, the, the step he makes after that, an identical proposition is one in which concept is compared only with concept, while a synthetic proposition is one in which the concept is compared with an object distinct from itself. Synthetic proposition automatically is about an object distinct from itself. And that's why I said you can think of that A equals B as the thing that is A is the same thing as the thing that is B, right? The synthetic judgment presupposes that there's something, a third thing outside A and B that is the object. I mean, that much comes from Kant, but I don't think Kant agrees that that is what constitutes being an external object. Okay, so in any case, so, so Schelling now is gonna try to explain how we can get knowledge and how we can get knowledge means how we can get synthetic judgments, how we can get attempts to make my concept agree with an object different from my concept? Where does the constraint come from or the rule about how different things, thoughts can be put together? So the empiricists say, of course, and this is the easy answer, the constraint comes from experience. And that's why all our knowledge comes from experience, not from reason. Of course, reason is great and it's really useful for all kinds of things, but it can't produce knowledge because uh, all it can do is take apart our concepts, you know, into the pieces we already had in them. It can't give us this kind of constraint that would allow us to learn something like all bodies are heavy. How do you learn all body, that all bodies are heavy? You take your concept body and you kind of go around the world hitting things with it. And then you experience them and you experience that they tend to move towards other bodies. They're heavy, right? So like you experience that apples fall off the tree and hit you on the head, that the moon goes around the earth and causes the tides and all those things. And from that, you learn that the synthetic judgment, all bodies are heavy, is true. Um, and uh, Kant agrees in the case of all bodies are heavy that that's how we learn it. So Kant agrees with the empiricists that that is the main or the usual, uh, I don't know exactly how to put it, but anyway, that that is 
like the normal source of synthetic truths. Kant also says there's another source of synthetic truths and um, what he calls synthetic a priori judgments. Things we know, judgments that are synthetic that we didn't learn from experience and the constraint has to come from somewhere else. But um, as I said, Schelling is going closer back to the rationalists again. He's really trying to explain how we can get all knowledge out of synthetic a priori judgments. We can get all knowledge, including the knowledge that we think comes from experience, actually by reasoning. So how does that make any sense? Well, um, so I could go into, and I guess I probably will a little bit when I talk about Schelling next time or the time after that, you know, I could go into like the way Kant tries to do it, at least for those things that he thinks it applies to. Um, but I think it's actually, it, it's a development of, and it's related to something that's easier to understand. And it's that very example from Descartes that I mentioned before. The first example in the meditations of something I know is that I exist. And somehow Descartes seems to get that out of nowhere just by thinking something not by an experience. Now, I mean, this is a matter of Descartes interpretation. So there's a way of interpreting Descartes that says that what happens in the second meditation is that Descartes kind of turns his inner eye and observes his self existing. But that that kind of vision is much better than external vision. But I think if you look in the second meditation at the point where this comes in called the cogito argument, right? The famous, I think, therefore I am. There is nothing like sensation. There's just an argument. Right, and the argument is, you know, it's about doubt, right? It's about like whether I could be um, mistaken in thinking that I doubt. Um, and the answer is raising the question whether I could be mistaken is doubting. <laughs> so no, <laughs> right? You couldn't be mistaken in thinking that you're doubting because if you're worried that you're mistaken, you're doubting. Right, so if you're reading this argument and you understand it, you're doubting and therefore you exist. So um, um, that's roughly speaking how it works. Um, so Schelling is gonna try to explain why it works in this case, why there's a special kind of thinking about something special kind of object I can think about that not only determines what I am thinking, that is A, right? Like what the concept I'm using to think it is, but actually produces what I'm thinking. That's the way Schelling is gonna understand why that works. There's other ways of understanding why it works. But that's the way Schelling is gonna understand how that argument can possibly work. The argument can work because it turns out there's a special type of object, which when I think it, of course, I'm certain that I'm thinking what I'm thinking, but not only that in the sense of right, A equals A, but, but in thinking that I produce that thing, I produce A and A is I myself. So one of the problems with this translation is that every time Schelling says in German, das ich, which, right, ich is just the German first person singular pronoun. It just means I. 
right? So that could be translated as the I, or it could also be translated as the ego, um, because das ich denke, um, it's really short for das ich denke, which is Kant's translation of the ego cogito, the I think, right? So anyway, it could be translated as I or as ego, but Heath almost always translated it as self. This is confusing especially when he has to talk about the I or the ego itself, because then he has to say the self itself. <laughs> um, so pretty much any time it says self, what Schelling is saying is ish, which again, you could translate it as I or as ego, which is the Latin word for I. Um, right, so the a judgment is I equals I or self equals self. And Schelling is going to argue that in the case of this one special argument, uh, of one special object, that since the thinking produces the object, this judgment is both certain in the way that any identical judgment is certain. It has the form A equals A. Actually, Schelling is going to say that's really the wrong way around, that really it, all these judgments of the form A equals A presuppose that I that thinks the first A and the same as the I that thinks the second A, right? So they, they really are derived from it rather than but but in any case, it, it, it has that identity that makes it certainly true. But it involves the knowledge of something actual. And in that sense, it's like a synthetic judgment. So Schelling says that this is the one point of our knowledge at which synthetic and analytic come together. So it both has what the rationalists want, which is a purely rational way of starting. Right, starting merely by knowing what I'm thinking, basically, um, without having to wait for anything to happen to me. It's a combination of that and what the empiricists and Kant want, which is a constraint by which I can compare my thought to an actual object, because it produces the actual object that I'm going to be comparing it with. And then Schelling is going to claim that. Um, not only is this a special, exceptional judgment, but that it's actually the first principle of all knowledge. So all knowledge, including what we normally think of as empirical knowledge, really derives from this one judgment, I equals I. Okay, that's everything I wanted to say today. Uh, there's a couple minutes left if you haven't question. Um, I hope that will end up being helpful, what I just said when you do the reading. Um, it's different from the introduction I get. Oh, yes, there's a, Clayton has a question. Yeah, just real quick. So you're saying that I wasn't entirely following. So the I versus I is kind of like the assumption that Schelling says the empiricists are making. No, the, so the I equals I is what Schelling wants to put in place, like where the empiricists say, this is where we need experience. We can't start just with a thought, right? Any thought, I wanna start with the thought of body or the thought of soul or the thought of God even, right? Any thought I wanna start with, when I look into that thought, I won't be able to tell whether I'm, I, there's, because it's arbitrary what I put into that thought, there was no constraint into my putting it together. I can take it apart to determine what I was thinking, but I won't have any clue as to whether there's something other than my thought out there to compare it with. And that's the prerequisite for knowledge. That's okay. what so the empiricists say, that's why you need experience. You would never learn that all bodies are heavy if you didn't have experience of what bodies do. Schelling is saying, no, that you're right, that just 
thinking ordinary identical propositions like a body is a body, a soul is a soul, God is God, freedom is freedom, etc., will never get you anywhere. You're not learning anything by doing that. At most, you might be clarifying your own thoughts, learning what was involved in them. Schelling says, yes, that's true for the most part. But what, what you empiricists have overlooked is where Descartes actually starts. It's with a very special thought. And if you start with that very special thought, you actually do have both. Everything is contained in my thought. I don't have to wait for any experience from outside of me. And you can kind of see why he's going to say this, right? The thought is about itself. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to wait for something from outside of it, so to speak. So, so, so he speak. sees it as the bridge between rationalism and empiricism? That kind well, of he sees it as, no, I mean, I think it's based on what Kant sees as a bridge between rationalism and empiricism. But as I said, I think the post-Kantian idealists are more like, no, rationalism was really better than empiricism, right? So it's more like the explanation of why the rationalists didn't really need to be corrected by being like bridged with empiricism if they were understood correctly, better than they understood themselves, I think he would say, right? That is, it takes Kant and Schelling to explain what's really going on in Descartes and Leibniz and Spinoza. Um, but once you understand how it really works, it's really reason is prior to experience. So rationalism is really true and empiricism really is not. Is that, is that helpful? Yeah, that makes more sense now. Yeah, okay. So, um, um, all right, I should probably go. I will have an office hour on Monday via Zoom, if you wanna to come to that. We'll not have an office hour on Tuesday because for the same reason I'm not having a lecture, it's a Jewish holiday. Um, um, I, sh I guess I should have said office hours also are by appointment. My schedule is a little bit busy, but if you can't make those times, um, you know, get in touch with me and we can find another time to meet via Zoom, probably via Zoom. I don't think I'm gonna be doing in-person meetings in my office right now. Um, one of my daughters is too young to be vaccinated. We're trying to be a little bit careful, but um, so, uh, yeah, and of course, you can always email me with questions as well. Um, and I will see you all next Thursday, I hope. Okay, bye. Yeah, I just wanted to say sorry for being late because I was having trouble uh, finding a place to set up Zoom. Oh yeah, no problem. And I realized I changed things at the last minute and everything, so. Yeah. Right. No okay, bye. Thanks.